Very good morning to you. What a privilege and honor uh, it is to be with you this uh, glorious morning. I'm here to bring you hope. In this situation of hopelessness all around us, when this pandemic is decimating our communities, there is hope. We have hope in Christ Jesus. And right at the inception, I want to pray. There's so many people this morning that are hurting. There's so many people that are broken. And we cannot be like an ostrich and dig a hole and bury our head in the sand and just believe that nothing's happening around us. There is a lot happening. And as believers in Jesus Christ, like the prophet Jeremiah, who I will mention later, we need to acknowledge that this is a lament. What is a lament? It's a passionate cry out to God. It's something where you cry out to God and say, I understand what you're doing, but give me the grace and the mercy to endure. And, and I'm not in no way suggesting that this is from God. I'm suggesting that we don't know. But all we do know is that we are human, we are frail, we are dust, and we cling on to the creator of this universe. His name is Jesus. Shall we pray? Our loving God and eternal Father, we bow humbly in your presence this morning. We thank you that you are a God of mercy. You are a God of grace that you love so unconditionally. And even as we bow before you, we are so aware of the fact that even as believers, we hurt. Even as believers, we cry. Even though we have the blessed hope in Christ Jesus, the pain is real. The hurt is real. And we know that many in our communities are struggling right now with the loss of loved ones, with financial loss, with those that are in hospitals, with those that are in home isolating and unwell, with those that are struggling to find oxygen tanks. And yet you are the one that breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. I pray this morning that you would bring healing upon our people that you will bring healing upon this nation. And we thank you that you have never abdicated the throne, that you are still on the throne. I pray particularly for Durban at the Kweni. I pray, God, that even as we've been declared the epicenter of this virus, I pray, God, that you will cleanse this land of this pandemic. You will cleanse this land of this virus. You said that if we bow before you and we confess our sins, you will hear from heaven, forgive our sins and heal the land. And I pray that you bring healing to this land. I pray for comfort for all, to all those that are mourning the loss of loved ones. Lord, I pray for those that are mourning the loss of close members of their family and friends. Even as I personally experience loss today, I pray God that you would bring peace and comfort to the many that are in hospital and to the families of those that are in hospital. I pray that you would bring peace and comfort to those that are isolating all alone, wherever they may be. Lord, you have to come through for us as a human race. We know that you are a God of peace. You are a God of comfort. You will remove this darkness. You will remove this shadow and let your light shine through the world. Let your light shine through South Africa. Let your shine, light shine through Durban. Even though all our church buildings are closed today, we still lift up our hearts in gratitude to you. We still give you all the praises. We give you all the honor. We give you all the worship. Lord, our buildings may be closed but our hearts are open to you. We want to praise you, not like the children of Israel placed you in their mouths, but their hearts were far from you. I pray that our hearts will rather praise you than our mouths, that we will feel a sense of loving you, of giving our lives as living sacrifices before you. Lord, I pray for the number of funerals that are taking place today, that you would bring comfort to those that would lay to rest the Lord lives of their loved ones. And I pray, God, that your word will become true to every single one when you said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I know, God, we can very well steer away from all that is going on around us. And we could speak about only the hope, but the hurt is real. 
And I pray that you'd bring peace and comfort to everyone that needs your peace this morning. Let your healing virtue flow. Let your peace flow. And I pray at the end of this time that we spend together, that we will walk away with a blessed hope. For we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I bring you greetings from Living Waters Church, from our leadership and uh, from our congregation, my dear wife, Cynthia, and my family. This is Pastor Christian Kiston. It's my joy and my privilege to be with you this morning. I want to read from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's listen to this beautiful hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. God bless you. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Passions, they fail not. As thou hast been, now forever will be. Summer and winter and spring. Join with the nature in manifold witness To thy great faithfulness, mercy and love Great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness him great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness and uh, we need to cling to that in the light of all that is going on right now and uh, I'm not going to apologize for telling you about these things because it's real and uh, I don't want to hide as a believer and pretend like we are not touched by these hurts and the pains and even Jesus said that he came and he was also touched by our infirmities you know, these funerals today, um, it's not like before. It's someone's living and the next thing they are 
in a grave or in a crematorium. That's the, it's the end. It brings to sharp focus the reality that this body is merely dust. But our relationship with Jesus Christ is all that matters. It comes into such sharp focus. Our perspective changes. There's a motivational speaker called Derek Clark, and he wrote six inspirational books, and he's a powerful motivational speaker. And I was looking up and trying to find some stories of hope, and I found this one, and I thought it's so appropriate, but I'm going to read it in his own words, because try as I may, I'm not able to express it the way he does. Now, don't you forget that in spite of all of this, my message to you is one of hope. We do not deny the tragedy around us, but we also acknowledge the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And this is what he says. He says, this is the story of my life, a life in which abuse, loneliness, and dark nights of despair rattle the very bones of my body, drain the tears of my spirit, shattered my mind into a million fragments and left me for a while plodding through life as an empty shell, a lost and a helpless soul. I have breathed the air of the unloved and suffered deep psychological and spiritual wounds due to abandonment at an early age by my mother and father. I have blamed myself for a past over which I had no control. My trust in people was displaced with hostility and anger, and yet my spirit would not be broken. I have fought for survival in the name of love, powered by a dogged worm whose voice never stepped, stopped yelling, me, uh, yelling out to me, never give up, never give up. I was a five-year-old kid and already a survivor of appalling events. I have never known my father, he writes. My mother, having given up on me, placed me in the county social services foster care system. She was desperate to be rid of me. The saddest, most inexplicable part of this was that she kept my younger brother and older sister. I was devastated knowing I had been deleted from the family. I was now motherless and fatherless. I loved my mother, my brother, and my sister, but my love for them wasn't enough for mum to keep me in the family. She claimed she couldn't control me and I was the devil, but the reality was that she was out of control. I found myself in a state where I wanted to give up and I wished I was never born. I wished I was given away at birth so that I wouldn't have had to endure the many memories and nightmares which have haunted me these many years. You know, there's always a lesson to be learned from adversity, he writes. I have learned many such lessons the hard way, but I found there is always light at the end of the tunnel. And I want to say to you tonight, this morning, never give up. The light at the end of the tunnel is just not any light. He is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. His name is Jesus. As believers, I want to tell you again, everything's been brought into sharp focus. Only Jesus is constant. He promised that he will never change. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. He writes, Derek Clark, it is this journey in which fractured souls are made whole again. It is this journey in which wounds are healed and pain is finally replaced with love and peace. I want to take you to the book of John chapter 8 and uh, the story is very familiar. The woman caught in adultery. So our first part of hope is no matter what your circumstances, you may have been given away as a child, you might have been discarded, you might have been divorced, you might have been hurt and abused and bruised, but never give up. The light at the end of the tunnel is our Lord Jesus Christ. There is hope.
in the midst of a storm. And this hope is in Jesus Christ Almighty. This woman in John chapter 8 was caught in adultery. The question I'd like to ask is, where was the man? Isn't he as guilty as she was? But this is society. How unfair can society be? How unfair can people and neighbors and loved ones and relatives be? They brought this woman to Jesus in the temple, not because they were righteous. They brought her there to shame her, to bring discredit to her. This posse, I could call them, of so-called righteous beings bring the so-called sinful woman and lay her at the feet of Jesus and say to Jesus, now Jesus, you know the law of Moses and this woman must be stoned. And then the Roman law determines that the only one that could condemn a citizen is Rome, not Jesus, not anybody. And so they thought they had Jesus between a rock and a hard place. If you condemn her, then the Roman government will be upon you. If you say don't stone her, then you are going against the law of Moses. If you say stone her, the Roman government will be against you. But you know, Jesus sat and he wrote on the sand. And to this day, nobody knows what he wrote. And we have so many theories, but I just think that he probably wrote the sins of those that brought that woman there. What do you think? I think he would have written on the sand, the first one that was standing close by, he would have written the person's name, he would have written the sin, and he, after that, when they kept badgering him and saying, Lord, what would you do? What must you do? He says, you who have no sin, cast the first stone. And you know what happens? The elders walked away first. Why? I just believe that Jesus tabulated the many sins of those that were older because they were older. And as they saw Jesus, right, they probably walked away in shame. But whatever he wrote, we're not sure. It's uh, just conjecture. However, one thing is for certain. He said to them, if you are without sin, cast the first stone. And as you walk into 2021, firstly, I want to say to you, your circumstances may be dire. However, there is hope not to give up. Secondly, you might be condemned by your church. You may be condemned by society. You may be condemned by the world. There might be every good reason that you shouldn't be condemned because according to the law of Moses, this woman caught in adultery should be stoned. According to Roman law, she should be condemned and given in to be killed because she had broken the law of Moses. Everything pointed to a demise. But when you meet the master, things change. You know, the Bible clearly says in John 8, 7, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And I want to say to you today that if you are without sin, then condemn another. Not one of us could fall into the category where we could say, I am without sin. And Jesus asked, asked this woman, he said, where are they? Has no one condemned you? <laughs> you know, the response is so wonderful. She says, no one, Lord. No one, Lord. She calls him Lord. No one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. And what does Jesus say? Neither do I condemn you. And I want to say to you, and this is my message of hope to you, that you may be a hopeless sinner. You may be someone that feels like you've been written off by society. Your community has discarded you. Your church family has re relegated you to the likes of sinful. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. And in 2021, I want you to walk tall knowing that Jesus does not condemn you. Great is his faithfulness towards you. He loves you. There is hope in a sense of hopelessness, in a sea of hopelessness. There is hope. Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah is a prophet. The book is really a little bit lopsided, and I say this in inverted commas. There isn't a proper theme through the book. The chronological events of this book 
are not chronological. That's why I, I cannot find anything to say about the chronology of this book. It's not chronological. It seems to be on either side like a seesaw, despair and hope, despair and hope. God says to Jeremiah, before, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. And then he goes on and says in verse 10, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to part. So the book of Jeremiah is one of lamenting. Now, a lament is not just complaining to God. A lament is a passionate cry to God like we are passionately crying out to God. We are lamenting before God concerning the coronavirus. We are crying out to him, passionately crying out to him. And Jeremiah did the same. Why? Because Israel was just 100 years old at that time. And God says to Jeremiah, and this is about the destruction of Judah, that I'm going to destroy Judah 100 years old. And he says to Jeremiah, I'm going to destroy Judah. The Babylonian Empire is going to come and take over Judah. This nation is going to be destroyed. Now, how, how do you know, how do you feel that your nation is just a fledgling nation, but God says, I'm going to destroy you. The God of Israel, who calls Israel the apple of his eye, says, I'm going to destroy you. And Jeremiah is struggling with, with, with that because God says to him, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. How, how do you balance that equation? And therefore, the book is difficult to understand. Not an easy book, but isn't our situation difficult to understand? Isn't our circumstances very, very hard to really conceptualize? Isn't it difficult right now to say, God, are you responsible for COVID-19? Or are you allowing it? Or is the devil doing it? Or is Bill Gates responsible? Or is China responsible? We don't know. We don't have answers. We are searching for answers. And that's how Jeremiah was. But the one thing that Jeremiah did was he cried out to God with a lament. He cried with a passionate plea to God. And I would to God that you and I would do that. Cry out to God with a passionate plea and say, Lord, I want you to come through for us. Give us the grace to go through. It is both a dismal and hopeful work, the book of Jeremiah, displaying a creative imagination almost unparalleled in the whole of Scripture. This prophet cries out. He cries out to God. And this pain was just so much for him to bear. However, I want you to know that what God has done for them, even what he did for Israel and Judah, he will do for you and I. However, this book of Exodus, where he reminds the children of Israel, didn't I bring you out of Egypt? Didn't I care for you in the desert? Didn't I give you manna from above? Didn't I allow quails to fall? Sometimes this book is referred to as the book of consolation. And so when you go through all of this pain and all of this tragedy and all of this difficulty, like in the book of Jeremiah, I want you to turn it around and see it as a book of consolation where you feel the peace of God. The Kelly J. Murphy writes the following, Set in the middle of the book, he can speak to those people who are still suffering and still attempting to survive in the face of what may seem like hopeless situation. The name Jeremiah means God exalts, God lifts up. The people and the land with its inhabitants will be restored. And I want to say to you today that we will be restored. This book that dares to speak of God's power to create new beginnings, it therefore serves as a stimulus for hope for God's people then and for God's people now. Even though after just 100 years, they were facing the wrath of Babylon, they did not lose hope. And I don't want you to lose hope today. You know, in various ways, I've said to you today that this body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, but it's mere dust. And this body must be transformed from mortal to immortality. You know, all those that have gone on to be with Jesus, they are now in the very presence of their King and of their God and of our King and of our God. Uh, I remember Rufus Daniel or Rufus Frank just gone to be with the Lord, buried his father not just two weeks, three weeks ago maybe. And uh, today 
his body would be laid to rest. And there's so many, I don't want to quote them all and bring this depression upon you. But in quoting that, I want to say to you, he was one of the most prolific singers in Durban during this time. He sang so beautifully about his Lord and his Master. He sang with Pastor Christy J. Perma and with Bethesda. What a real stalwart in the kingdom of God, gone to be with Jesus. But you know what? His body may be here, but he's singing in heaven today with a host of heaven's angels. They're glorifying and praising God. And so in the book of Jeremiah, we see a sense of hopelessness. But in all of that hopelessness, God is doing something new. And in your life, God is doing something new. And what happened after this? Listen, there God restores Israel and Judah. During the 1918 Spanish flu, 500 million people lost their lives. 500 million. That's one third of the world's population in 1918. And immediately after that, we have what we refer to as the Roaring Twenties, when everything started to develop and everything was restored. And we had the wonderful age of the Twenties. Now, I want to say to you that this pandemic is not going to last forever. Don't listen to every conspiracy theorist. And I'm not here to advocate for vaccines or not. But I want to remind you that the vaccines for polio, for measles, for rubella, for mumps have all helped humanity. And we've actually rid ourselves from polio. Maybe the vaccine will be there to help us. I'm not sure. I don't know. But we place our hope not in a vaccine. We place our hope not in, in humanity, not in a government. We place our hope firmly upon our Lord Jesus Christ. Even if a vaccine saves us, this body must die. And when this body dies, what happens then for all of eternity is the crucial question. What happens then determines who you and I are really. A new beginning does not negate the past, but builds on it. And so the new beginning that we are looking forward to does not negate the past, but builds upon it. Listen, a new year starts the new rotation of the sun. And I taught geography for some time and I enjoy teaching geography. And I learned that the sun, really the earth, orbits the sun. The earth, in other words, goes around the sun. The sun is constant. The sun never moves. It's constant. And Jesus is constant. He is the son of righteousness. And we revolve and gravitate around him. And the start of a new year heralds a new orbit. It, the earth starts a new rotation around the sun. And while the earth is rota revolving around the sun, we have the moon rotating around the earth, you know, it's, it's such a beautiful mathematical equation. It's so beautiful that nothing changes for millennia. And as this new year begins with the earth revolving around the sun and this rotation going on, I want to remind you that we need to gravitate towards the sun of righteousness. As a new year begins, let's start all anew, all afresh. And the promise of a new year inspires more than the opening of a new calendar, not just the 1st of January. It reinforces the start of a new rotation around the sun, a new start, a new beginning, a new hope, the continued distribution of more of these uh, vaccines of COVID-19 provide us the potential for a new normal. Hope comes into the world upon the light of Christ and the promise of restoration and flourishing. Hope comes into the world wanting to be received to the children of the covenant. That's you and I. This is the New Testament in my blood. Hope comes into the world with the sound of singing and the shouts of joy. Hope comes into the world like the dawn of a new day, shining first from a distant horizon while moving ever closer and gathering those who, who were scattered back safely and securely into the shepherd's flock. You know, the grateful, we should be so grateful to God. 
What critical opportunity does the story of tragic suffering and loss present for theological reflection? What does it say to you and I when we look at everything that has gone on? A few things. Firstly, that we need to love each other, that God is our constant, that Jesus is our master. We need to pray for each other. You know, this virus has reduced every one of us to common humanity. There is no one that is exempt from the commonality of the infection of this virus. We all are equal and we all are the same. Did it ever, do you ever wonder how people of different race groups, different ethnicities all over the world, everywhere in the world could all come under the infection of this little microscopic organism I say organism, a virus is not really a living organism, but has it ever occurred to you how close we really are one to the other? You know, there were times that we'd sit next to each other in a bus or wherever on a park bench and never thought that we are breathing each other's air. But that's what we are doing. We are common. We are human. We need to love each other. We need to care for each other. And we need to pray for each other. This has brought us together like nothing else has. Our world right now is basically shut down. It's a place we don't recognize anymore. Marketplaces are empty. Shopping malls are running out of stock. And our churches are empty. In fact, they're closed. It feels like the end of the world. We have social distancing. However, you ever thought about the social distancing? You know, it's hard. I mean, we as human beings, especially in South Africa, we're very friendly people in South Africa. We love to shake hands. We love to hug. We love to kiss. We love to rub shoulders with each other. We love to share a bri with friends. We love to visit each other. We have a beautiful community in South Africa. This is a wonderful country. I mean, there's so many so-called brides that go on so often. But you know what? Now there's social distancing. Now there's a ridiculous greeting of the elbow. And we've got to be careful not to hit too hard. It's so ridiculous. The social distancing is so ridiculous. It's not who we are. We have to do it because it is expected of us. But have you ever considered that whenever God needed to speak to somebody, there was social distancing. Yes, when he was speaking to Elijah, where was Elijah? He was alone in a cave and God spoke to him. Maybe, just maybe, God wants to speak to you. And he's taken you aside for a while and taken me aside for a while to speak to us, to speak into our ears. A still small voice. What about Jesus? He was in the wilderness for 40 days, all alone, social distancing. And it was there that he had an intimate conversation and relationship with the Father. Can you use this time of being, a, of being alone and being quiet to have an intimate relationship with the Father? These are difficult days. I want to leave you with this. God's own Son came so that he could touch us so that he could be with us. Didn't he break the social distancing? Didn't God the Father in the incarnation break this thing about handshaking and social distancing? Didn't he come because he wanted to shake our hands? The Bible says he touched the lepers, he touched us, he touched humanity, he was touched in all places like we are today. We're not allowed to touch can we go back to the master and let him break this impasse, let him break the social distancing, this challenges, uh, the challenges that we are facing right now? There is hope. There is hope. There is hope. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 following, Paul the Apostle says that this is a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall be awakened in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The trumpet shall sound and we shall be changed. This mortal shall put on immortality. And I want you to stay with that blessed hope. Paul says, 
we shall not all sleep. Sleep is a temporary state. It is not a permanent state of death. It's a temporary state. The great apostle J.F. Rowlands, when he did a number of funerals, always he would say, at that time they used to be kissing the dead bodies, not anymore, it shouldn't happen. He said, kiss your loved one good night till the resurrection morning. Say good night till the resurrection morning because there is hope. And the hope I leave you with is in Christ Jesus. Listen, you could sit and mourn this virus. You could sit and be hopeless today. You could sit and cry the whole day. And I know you and I are human and we're going to feel hurt. I'm going to a funeral in a little while and I, I, I'm going to be sitting in a car and watching this entire thing of my sister, my cousin. It's going to be painful. So we cannot deny that the pain is real. We cannot deny that. But in spite of all of that, I want you to know that our hope is in Christ Jesus. I want you to have the joy of the Lord in your soul because even if the devil takes your life, even if the devil takes our lives, I want you to know our souls are secure, that we will forever be with Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to put a wonderful smile on your face. I want you to be full of the joy of the Lord. I want you to be happy because I tell you what, God's going to restore. This pandemic is not going to last forever. It's going to be gone. Your pain, your hurt, your discouragement, all that you're going through right now is not going to be forever. It's going to pass. It's going to be gone. And God will forever be on the throne. This is Pastor Christian Kisten coming to you live for Living Waters Church in Durban North, bringing greetings again from my dear wife, Cynthia, my family, our leadership of the church, and every single loved one at Living Waters Church. We love you, no matter where you are in this world and where you are listening from, you are not just, uh, it's just not the members of Living Waters Church, but we love you, you are special, because you are my brother, you are my sister. God bless you. Let's receive the benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee shalom. God bless you.